Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Cody Richardson. Cody, welcome to the show. Thank you, Vic. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, we're all really happy to have you here, so thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Cody, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay, I'm 40 years old. I've spent a lot of my life in the woods. I spent 14 years as a wildland firefighter on a 20-man hand cruise. I got a little background in construction. I'm recently married. We got married about a year ago, but we've been together about a dozen years. And uh, I've spent my life between Southern Oregon and Southern California. Well, it sounds to me like you've carved a good life out for yourself. I'm impressed. It's been an interesting ride. Let's just say that. And I'm extremely happy that I can come on and share my experiences. So other people, when they see these things and have to deal with them, won't be maybe quite as scared as I was. Well, like I told you before, it's awfully impressive that you would do it for that reason. That's really impressive. You've been listening to the show for years, but didn't contact me until about a week ago, Cody. Why'd you wait so long to reach out? You know, I just wasn't sure if I wanted to come on and tell my story, but in retrospect, I probably should have contacted you earlier to get my story out there because it started from a young age for me and I just think it's important that people know that these things are out there so that they can A, be aware and B, not put themselves into situations where these things could exploit you and take advantage of you. Well, like I told you, it's awfully admirable that you would do it for that reason. Also, like I told you in that first conversation, there are a lot of people on the West Coast who know about dogmen who believe that dogmen can't even be found out that way. So, yeah, for more reason than one, it's great to have you come on and Talk about these encounters. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Vic. And listening to all these stories, I see so many parallels from my experiences to all your shows that you have on there. That's pretty much what convinced me to come onto your show and share my story is all these people are having these other experiences that are along the same lines as mine throughout the country and that people need to know about it. Well, you notice the parallels because, like I told you also, for the most part, most of these encounters are pretty much the same, just some of the variables are a little bit different. So it makes sense. I mean, if you see a black bear, for example, when people come back and talk about the experience, you'd expect a lot of the details to be similar. So this is no different. What kind of kid were you before you had all the encounters with Dogman you're going to tell us about tonight? I was a bit of a, a nerdy kid. I wasn't your normal outdoorsy person because I moved to Oregon when I was 10 years old and I had grown up on a beach in Southern California prior to that time. But it was really odd for me because I wasn't allowed in the water. I had some serious ear issues growing up as a kid. And anytime I got water in my ears, uh, I got ear infections. So I was kind of a sickly kid, but moving to Oregon, I was really excited being a kid because we moved out to the forest. It was something new. It was a brand new adventure. Well, I can't even imagine how excited you must have been. I mean, moving out to Oregon at 10 for me, that would have just blown me away. So, yeah, I can totally understand. Like you mentioned just a bit ago, your encounters began when you were almost 10 years old. What kinds of long-lasting effects did those encounters have on you and the way you developed in life? Oh, man. Well... On the positive side, it probably helped me deal with my fear factor of things in life and things that are about to get you. It probably helped me become a better firefighter, to be honest, because I learned how to corral my fear, look at things logically, and deal with it accordingly. It is hard to think that if you have experiences like the ones you're going to tell us about, that anything good could come from it. But in a lot of cases, good things do come from the encounters people have. Maybe the good that you get from the encounters does not weigh the bad, but 
Surprisingly, sometimes there are good things that come of them. Do you think you're somehow a better person today because of the encounters you had, or do you think you'd be a better person if you never would have had them? Oh, I'm, I'm better off as a person. Um, because of my experiences, I ended up having to go to two high schools. I had stopped going to high school here in Oregon because of these encounters. And back then, I was not dealing with it healthy at all. But throughout the years and looking back on it and reflecting, the fact that I went to two different high schools, the fact that I had to move to deal with it, it definitely made me a stronger person as in being able to enter new experiences and be able to go out and be a little more outgoing as a person so that I, I had to go meet new people and stick myself in new situations. So it definitely in the end made me a stronger person and helped me become who I am today for sure. Well, while I'm sorry to hear you had to experience those encounters, I'm glad to hear that you've experienced a net gain in the end. So that's a good thing. Yeah, it, it may have taken years for the net game to happen. And even while it was happening, I'm very grateful that I got to go finish high school in California because in my adult life, I've gone back. I spent a few years uh, in Santa Barbara in my 20s uh, working construction, learning a trade, and I would have never gone back down there had I not finished high school down there. So it definitely rounded me out as a person for sure. Well, as long as you can say that, then that's a good thing. That's great. After having all the encounters that you've had with dog men, what would you say is the creepiest thing about them, Cody? <sighs> I would have to say their ability to sneak up on you and then just stare at you. And then it's like they're expecting a reaction out of you. It's like they know you're going to fear it. It's kind of like they want to see you in this phase of fear. And that quite a few times during my experiences, why else would it be looking in my window? And then when I saw it a couple of times, when it realized that I could see it and I wasn't just looking at the reflection, it tossed its ears back and grimaced at me and bared its teeth. I don't know if it growled the couple times that it did that through the window, but when it noticed that I saw it looking at me, it definitely tried to scare me. Because if it wanted to, it could have punched right through that window, grabbed me and hauled me right out and been dispatched me right there. But it didn't. You're right. You are right. And I'm so glad that you realized that. From what I understand, a friend of yours disappeared around the time when you were having your encounters. What more can you tell us about that? Well... When she disappeared, um, it was from the same woods where I was having my experiences. She disappeared without a trace. She was a very good friend of mine. Um, when Caitlin disappeared, it was the whole hubbub of Roosh. It's, it's a very small town, um, so small that we get bussed into Medford, you know, 20 miles away to go to junior high and high school. So it's a very small community of people out here. And when she disappeared, I was always thinking the worst that one of these things got her because she disappeared somewhere about a mile from my property. And it's all the same woods. Back then, there weren't any fences. There were uh, old cut roads that we could walk on that connect from my house all the way to where she disappeared. There's one trail in particular that it's a straight shot that I know that she was always walking on. And it was always in the back of my mind that, you know, she had talked about running away because she didn't like her family life that much. And I had always hoped that she did just run away. But unfortunately in 08, a couple months before I moved back to Oregon, her, her bones were found very close to where she was last seen in a field. So I don't think a dog man got her honestly, now that all the facts are out, but it was always lingering there in my head because she had disappeared right then and there. And it was, it was a pretty traumatic for event for all involved. I had always hoped that she did just run away. That was always my hope because when I was finishing high school down in California, you know how you get the postcard, have you seen me in the mail of missing people from around the country? I got one of those with her picture on it. And it 
made me break down and cry. Wow, that is horrible. Like you said, more than likely it wasn't a dog man, but I guess we're never going to know. Yeah. And it, it's just, it, it's really sad because she was a really awesome person. Yeah, that does make it even more upsetting. All right, Cody, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. It all started out when uh, my mom bought 10 acres of property in 1989. Her and my dad were having issues, so my mom moved us out to the property from Southern California in, I think it was the first week of November of 1989. Now, this property is about a mile away from the store of Roosh, maybe a little more. It was backed by BLM land up against a mountain, Granite Mountain, which was next to Wood Rat Mountain. And if you're a hang glider, that's a world-renowned hang gliding spot. And uh, when we moved there, you know, we had a driveway that was about a little under a half a mile long. It made a couple 90 two 90 degree turns, you'd go up and then it'd make a 90 degree turn. And then you'd go for, I don't know, three, 400 feet and, and make another 90 degree turn to the left. And then you'd be on the property on the lower end of the property. And this lower end of the property where the road comes through on the corner, this is where most of my experiences came from, where I'd see glowing eyes in the bushes in the same positions in the same places periodically because we had to walk to get down to the bus every day back and forth. And in Oregon, it's dark when you go to school in the morning and in the wintertime, it's dark at 4.30 and I'd get home at like 4.15 or 4.30, depending on traffic in that day. (sighs) When we first came to the property, I thought it was a great adventure. The property was super thick. It was forested in some pretty big timber. There was probably about three acres of the tin that had heavy chaparral and thick, thick, thick bushes. It had a very creepy vibe. Let's just give it that. Now, the first week that we were there, and I know this specifically because I was sleeping on the floor without all my stuff, the uh, moving van took six days to get up there to us before we unloaded it and had our stuff. My first experience with these things was I was asleep on my floor of my room with my head under the window. We had a double wide mobile home that had a deck around the backside that led to an above ground four foot pool. The whole place was situated on a cut out of the mountain. So a little bit of a platform Right at our property, the back end is when it really started to get really steep up the mountain, but we were still had a little bit of incline on the property. On the left side, there was a gully that was probably, I don't know, a dozen or so feet deep on the left side of the property where water would flow in the winter times when things got wet. That whole side of the mountain would actually drain down off of our property because we were on the low end. Anything to the left of us would drain off down onto the tumbleweed side, but this whole side of the ridge drained down directly onto our property because the way things flowed. So it was a pretty wet piece of property in the wintertime. We didn't have normally creeks going through there, but in the wet years, we had the ditches would always have water in them because it tended to rain a lot. Now, back to my first encounter, I was asleep in a sleeping bag directly underneath the window. And in the middle of the night, something slammed into the side of the mobile and made a loud banging noise and woke me up. And what I saw was something that had ears on the top of its head looking in the window. Because its shadow, because of the moon, I could clearly see shoulders, head, and two pointy things. It was just a round head. At this point, I couldn't see anything but the shadow. And it scared the bejeebies out of me because it meant that something was standing in my window directly over me and that it was probably at least seven to eight feet tall. Now, being a 10-year-old kid, I saw that and was like, oh, that's not good. And literally rolled over and just pulled the covers over my head and went back to sleep. 
Now, this is a reoccurring thing that keeps happening in the winter times for me was it was consistently every so often looking in the window. And that first time, just in the back of my head, man, I was scared. Okay, something's in the window. I can't deal with, like, I have an older sister. She's uh, three years older than I. And I, that first time, made a mistake of thinking that there was a monster looking me in the window. And my sister did nothing ever but tease me, make fun of me, and make my life very difficult growing up. That proceeded on to us being adults. I made the mistake of telling her I thought there was a monster in my window, and she consistently teased me about it. So any of my other experiences, I never said a word to her. I just shut up after that because she definitely just had a liked poking fun at me for whatever. And it was not really fun growing up with someone like that. So onward, the property that we're on was really thick with chaparral. The first year that we were there, when we moved up there, my dad was with us and he helped with the move. Well, after about two weeks, dad had to go back down to work to Southern California and left us there. It was just mom, my sister and I. And the first year, my sister and I had different times to catch the bus. So I could be a few minutes later running down the driveway than her by about 15 minutes because I only had to go to Rusha Elementary. She had to catch the early bus that would take her into uh, town to go to junior high. On the corner where the road is, on the corner of the property where I have most of my experiences, I kept seeing yellow eyes looking at me, glowing yellow eyes. Let me be very more specific. They'd be looking at me through the chaparral, under the brush, and through the brush, if that makes any sense. All I could see were glowing yellow eyes. In these times, those eyes never really moved when I'd come walking by because I was always in a hurry, but they were definitely staring at me the entire time. And being a 10-year-old kid, I didn't know what they were. I didn't think it was anything of it, you know? But uh, every time I'd walk through there, this is the low point in the property where all the water flowed through. And I didn't even think about that. And obviously, animals like water, and they were, seemed to always hang out in this section of the property. Now, let's fast forward a couple months, and I come home from school. I was always the first one home. It was my responsibility to make the fire in the fireplace for the day because it was always a bit chilly out. I decided after making the fire and getting it going, I wanted to go do some exploring. My sister wasn't home yet. So I go down to the lower end of the property where if I were to go out my front door, not the back door where the carport is, but if you're looking down the hill, I'd walk out into the grass and then I'd walk down a little, little embankment, maybe a dozen, 12 feet, 15 feet where the cutout for the whole place was. We had a little lawn in the front and I'm just going exploring down and into the woods. Now it was really thick with chaparral on the lower end back then. And I'm down there just flipping over rocks and checking stuff out. And all of a sudden I got this intense fear. Like I, I had never experienced this before. It was seriously a fight or flight feeling. And I look around and I didn't see anything, but my gut was telling me, get away get away now. Something's here. Something's not right. And I was only maybe a hundred feet from the cut of where the grass grows for the, our front yard. And I just slowly backed up looking all around me, came in the same way I went out, slowly backing up. This happened that first year more than a few times, pretty much any time I went into the woods alone I got this feeling of being watched and or just this fear of flight or fight where I, I had to get away and I had to get away now. I was a very small kid. I didn't understand exactly what was going on, why I was getting these feelings. I wasn't getting it. I didn't see anything like in the flesh and blood. I, I didn't see anything. Now, granted, right where this happened, 
one of the bigger trees on the property, a pine tree, it was probably, a, I don't even know how tall it was. It's one of the taller pine trees on the property. It was a big boy. I mean, he, I couldn't reach my arms around it for sure. It was a big tree, probably 100, 150 feet tall, had four claw marks on it, like something had repeatedly clawed it in the same place over and over. And I remember standing at the base of the tree and putting my hand up to where the claw marks were, and I could just barely touch the bottom couple inches of it, but it stretched for a good three feet, three and a half feet further up. And I just remember thinking, man, that must be one big bear because these claw marks were set several inches apart. I remember putting my hand up to it. If I had my thumb on the left side, I'd only hit the third claw mark. Granted, I was a little smaller back then. And I just remember thinking, man, that's, that's got to be one big bear. Now, I never saw much wildlife on the property ever. I only saw deer the entire time that I lived there several times on the property. It was always on the upper half of the property coming off the hill. I never saw deer down on the lower section of the property. After basically what I would call getting chased out of the woods, but not really, I knew some, it felt like something was there and I needed to get away. I just stopped going out into the woods after I got home. I would go out with friends, would come over once in a while. My sister would have a friend over and we'd go out, but I would not go out there alone just wouldn't do it. The first time that I saw a wolf's head in my window when I was in my room fiddling with my radio really, really got me. About six months after living on the property, my mom had gotten us a lab so that there was a dog on the property. He, he was an older dog. We got him when he was nine years old. He was a fully trained bird dog for duck hunting, I believe. And we basically just let him roam around. We didn't have a kennel for him for the first couple of years. He just sort of did his own thing and hung out and didn't really go too far. I knew it was not this dog. Max was not capable of getting his head this high. And it was a completely different color and twice as big of a head. Now, when it happened, my sister was in her room next to me and I contemplated saying something, but I didn't because she really liked to terrorize me and poke fun at me or anything I said. She was not a nice person at all. I kept it to myself. I shut my curtains. My mom had previously just made my curtains. Um, I think I'd been there five or six months, about the same time that we got Max. Mom had finally sewn me up some curtains and I thought I had seen something before this in my window. So I was very grateful to get the curtains up to where I could fully shut them so nothing could look in. Well, they were open about six inches and I'm fiddling with my radio and I see movement in the window and I look over and there's just between the gaps, I see a nose, a snout and an ear and an eye looking at me. And I did a double take of crack my head to the left, look forward and look back. And in that instant, it was gone because it obviously knew that I had seen it because I twisted my head at it. That really put the bejeebies in me. So I shut the curtains. And at this point, I think I had seen something in the window a couple of times. I, that was the first clear look that I got at this thing. And it was halfway up the window. And for it to be that tall, it had to have been seven foot tall because there was a, I don't know, a two and a half, three foot skirt around the mobile home that raised it up off the ground. So yeah, it had to have been about seven, seven and a half feet tall. Now, I never told my mom because my mom was always busy and had other things going on. And I never told my sister and I never told anyone. I kept it to myself and was just like, oh, okay, there's a monster out there. Now, after the first year of living on the property, my dad wasn't there. 
I stopped going into the woods, literally stopped going into the woods. The first time I felt safe was after the property had gotten cleared. I think I was in sixth grade. My parents hired a tractor to come in and make piles of all the chaparral on the property. And they logged about two or three tractor trailer loads of trees off the property. The tree that had the claw marks on it was one of the bigger trees on the property and they logged it. I should have gotten a picture of those claw marks back then, but being a kid, didn't even think about it. When I was outside, I think this was about seventh grade for me. So this is three or four years of living on the property. I had gotten a Audubon Society book about mushrooms. I was in the Boy Scouts and I was down off the side of where the grass grew, trying to identify all the mushrooms that were growing in the grass clippings and around. Because when it gets wet here, mushrooms grow everywhere. You know, it's a forest. There's got dead and decaying wood everywhere. And I'm checking out this mushroom and this black flash literally came running within 20 feet of me and then made a 90 degree turn and bolted the other way. I think when it saw me, cause I was kind of ducked down checking out these mushrooms and it happened so fast out of the corner of my eye. All I saw was this black streak and I knew it was something. Because it was relatively close to where I was, but out of the corner of my eye, it happened so fast, like a cheetah in the woods, basically. Let me, let me, I missed one point here. When we had first moved onto the property, we had gophers all over the place. And I was out exploring on the upper part of the property, and I came across an extremely large dog print. It was huge. It was in the fresh mound of the gophers all over the place, there's mounds from gophers. And this was an extremely fresh mound from the gopher. And this was an extremely fresh print. And that couple was seeing that thing in my window. I kind of knew in the back of my head, something was there. A few times I had seen this, what I just described as the black flash, just bolting from cover to cover. It would always be split second, and it was always much faster than anything that I know of in the woods. And it was always far away. I'd always see it when I would be at a distance, and I'd see something run from cover from one bush to another bush. And then, well, what was that? And then try and figure it out, and then I wouldn't see anything. Well, sometime later, somewhere else, I'd see the same thing. A couple of times, I was with my best friend, Tyler. And we had seen something. When we were in junior high, we were walking from my property the long way around down to his house. Now, the long way was through the woods, through this trail that connected on the lower end to our driveway. When we got down towards his house, because he lived literally through the vineyards and lived out in the field, we had just crossed a cattle guard that was over one of the drainage canals that water was going through. And we cross it and down across the field, we see something black and something the size of a bear dart from one side of the berry bushes across a road that runs through the middle of the valley to the other berry bushes and disappeared in two seconds. This thing traveled. 50 feet in two seconds. And it was just a flash and it was huge. And we both look at each other and like, what was that? That had to have been a bear. That had to have been a bear. Tyler, my best friend, liked to describe things as a bear. I'll get to that a little later. Not really thinking anything of it. We're just like, oh, we better stay on our toes and not go over that direction. We take that road to cut through the middle of the valley in the summers all the time to get to the river Cantrell Buckley on the other side to go swim for the day. Cause in Roosh there's not a whole lot to do. So we just took note and just to be very cautious when walking through all the mounds of berries in there. 
another time with when I was with Tyler, we were walking down his driveway and the same culvert we had just walked over. There was probably a quarter mile distance between the two culverts, his driveway and the other driveway where we originally saw this, there was just a big wheat field surrounding his house. And we had just crossed the culvert down to the driveway to his house and way down on the other side where the field ended, it was surrounded by berry bushes all the way around. Well, something came out of the berry bushes and bolted for the pond. And then when it bolted for the pond, like lightning, this thing was huge and it moved so fast. And when it got to the pond, it dove into the bushes on the right hand side. Those same bushes were berry bushes that pretty much wrapped all the way around that giant wheat field. And we were just like, oh, there must be a bear living in there because those sightings were a, a few months apart. I know they were in the same year. I know that much, but they were a couple months apart. The wheat was growing in the field, so it was probably early spring when the second one happened. Now, we were just like, okay, we need to be a little more careful. And we didn't give it much thought. We really didn't. Being teenagers now, Tyler came up to my house one afternoon and we decided to go hike the mountain behind us, Granite Mountain. And we had gone up to the uh, relay tower. There was a tower up there, I think, that relayed um, TV signals. And that was maybe a, a third of the way up the ridge line, maybe halfway up the ridge line. And we had never gone higher than that. So we decided to go hike the mountain. And it, this is a really steep mountain. I mean, 50% grade, 60% grade, it's super steep. We're hiking up there. We got to the, the tower and the cut road that gets to the tower. We walked a little ways back on it and then decided to cut up one of the draws right up the center because that seemed to be the fastest way to get to the ridge line. And we're hiking up this thing and we're a few hundred, I don't know, three or 400 feet from the crest of the ridge, not the top of where we could get to, onto the ridge line and then hike the ridge line up. And I had to stop to take a leak. So I stop at a big tree and then take a couple steps off to the side and do my business. As I'm finishing up, my friend Tyler just starts running down the hill. After he got a few steps, as I'm zipping up my zipper, he looks at me and screams, run. And I'm thinking, run, what is going on? So I step out from behind the tree and look up the hill. And that's when my blood just ran cold. This thing was on all fours, barreling towards me. And the only real impression, because I only looked at it for about two seconds before I turned tail and run. It was on all fours. It was huge. This head on it was massive. It had a wolf's head with a very long snout, very dark black fur. And the fur on it was so long that when it made a jump, I guess when it was running towards me, you could tell that it almost looked like it was dreadlocked. Uh, on the side of it because I'm just seeing a black silhouette and then I can see tangles of very long hair and a wolf's head. I turn tail and run. And by the time I turned and run, this thing was probably closer than 100 feet. It had cleared some distance in the two seconds that I was looking at it. This thing moved and it moved like a cheetah that was trying to run away from the devil himself. It moved so fast. And I just remember thinking it definitely had very weird movements between the shoulders because that's what I was looking at. And it just, it looked very odd. Well, that and the giant's wolf's head, I turned tail and ran. And the mountain's so steep here, if you jump over a bush, all of a sudden you got three feet down. I just kept jumping over things, trying not to fall down. Tyler kept running. He had a good lead on me. I looked back once when I was about a hundred feet down the hill 
And this thing had stopped right at the tree where I had done my business and was walking across the tree towards the bush where I had peed. And I'm thinking, oh God, thank God it stopped and then kept running and didn't stop running till we got back to my house. Now, Tyler wouldn't talk about it. I'd try, he'd be like, that was a bear. And I was like, that was no bear I've ever seen. It had a wolf's head. The thing was massive. It was the size bigger than a bear. It was huge. Tyler really wouldn't talk about it. I tried to get him on a few occasions to talk about what we had seen, and he just, he clammed up. He didn't want to talk about it. Tyler was my best friend growing up. You know, like any good friend growing up in your teenage years, we got in a couple fist fights and we knocked each other a couple times, but we're, we were pretty close. <sighs> that happened and we were just stunned. I, I had told my dad, I think we saw a bear today. I'm not sure what it was. And he was like, oh yeah, you must have seen a bear when I described it to him. But I'm like, dad, it had a wolf's head. What has a wolf's head? He's like, oh, you just, you just saw a bear. Like, I don't think that's what it was, but okay. And I knew that something was in those woods that wasn't supposed to be there. Because I, I didn't tell anyone about something looking in my window. Another time, Tyler was up at my house. This was sometime when I was in high school. I think this was my sophomore year. Uh, we decided just to go out and dink around. It was winter time. We started hiking from the house on the left side of the property. There's a ravine that pretty much follows the property line up. We were a good ways up there. You could just barely see the house. We had passed about four logs that were down, kind of like pickup sticks at one point all across each other. And we're just hanging out, walking around. I had my BB gun with me. Tyler had his. And... We were just thinking around, not doing anything. And I got that feeling of all of a sudden, something's there. I'm being watched. I start looking around. And from where the pile of wood was, the trees down, there was three large trees that had rotted out and fallen. There was a massive wolf's head looking, just straight staring at me. It was completely black, very large pointed ears, extremely long muzzle. Now only its head was peeking over to the top. This thing had black eyes. It was just staring at me. It didn't seem like it blinked. I stared directly back at it and I yelled at Tyler who was about 25 feet away from me. He couldn't see what I was looking at because trees from his direction were blocking it. I yell at him, Tyler, look, and he looks at me. He's all, what? I'm looking straight dead nuts at it. And I said, come here, look at, look, look. And I point at it. Well, he comes over to where I'm standing. This thing didn't move. It was massive. The head was larger than the top tree. I actually ended up going back and measuring after the fact by about a week with my dad's measuring tape. And its head from snout to ear was about three feet. Now, This is after we'd been chased off the hill. I believe it's the same one because of the dark color and the long muzzle. I got the bright ideas. We're both staring at it. I wanted to see the rest of it. I could only see its head. I bolted at about a 45 degree angle off to the side. So I ran down basically on the property line, trying to get to a point where I could see the rest of this thing. Well, as soon as I started running, I lost sight of it because there's a bunch of trees. Tyler was staring directly at it. And he said, as soon as I started running, it disappeared. When I got to a spot where I could see where it had been standing, not only was it gone, it was completely gone. And from our vantage point, it was kind of a high point on the property. This thing had to have moved at breakneck speeds because it didn't come down in the little ravine that I was in. Tyler had a clear view on the upper part of the property. It didn't go that way. It had to have gone directly by the house and it had to have done that 
at really fast speeds. We were just at the point where you could barely see the house from, from where it was standing on the wood standing up lightning fast. It really scared the bejeebies out of me because Tyler was like, what? It's a dog. And I'm like, Tyler, if it was a dog, where did it go? I mean, it didn't come into the ravine. I did not see it come down here. And you said it didn't pass on the upper section. So the only way it could have gone is directly at the house and then use the house as cover. And that was a good few hundred feet away. I, my guess right from that spot would be about 300 feet, something like that. And we just look at each other. And I said it at the time. And I was like, I think it was that, you know what, that chased us off the hill. Because if it was, if it was a dog, it would just be sniffing something and hanging out. Well, we both went inside for the rest of the day and played Nintendo and called it a day. And that one in and of itself is even more scary because I think, and this is total interjection on my part, a couple weeks prior, I was out with my BB gun and I had killed a small rabbit and buried it on the lower section of the property under rocks. I didn't eat it. I should have. I should have skinned it and done my thing. I think it was staring at me to let me know that a, it could probably eat me if it wanted to, and that B, not to do that. Because honestly, I thought about it for a while, and after this incident, I think it was about a week later, I actually went back to where I buried the, it wasn't even buried, it was just basically under rocks, a bunch of rocks, and something had moved all the rocks and retrieved, the rabbit wasn't there. It would have been a month after the fact, and it would have been smelly and decaying and everything else, but it was not there. Something had pulled the rocks up and, and took it. And I honestly think that it was that thing pissed off that I killed its dinner or lunch or whatever, and that I was wasteful. Now, it's total interjection. I could be wrong, but I think that's why it was staring at me. I think it had probably maybe even watched me do it and was a little pissed. And yeah. The next incident was actually a bit prior to that. My dad was living with us and it was right when we had had the property cleared with the tractor. I was coming out the front door, so I'm facing downhill. My dad was out with the chainsaw, sawing up a bunch of logs off of a pile across from the garden and kind of the spot where we park extra cars down below. Well, I looked, Along the fence line, our other property line on the other side, there's a big field that's fenced in. There was a ginormous wolf-looking dog sitting down. Its head was as tall as the fence it was next to. That fence was three and a half or four feet tall. I remember it was just sitting there watching my dad with the chainsaw. He had earmuffs on and the full get up and he was busy doing his thing. And I'm walking first down the steps from the doorway of our house, the front door, then down the steps to the swing. And I'm just staring at it. And this thing's just staring at black eyes, the same black, large, huge head. And it was sitting there like a dog would be sitting with its legs in front. And I'm just thinking, that's the biggest wolf I've ever seen. And I walk over to my dad, who's still chainsawing. And I stop a little ways away from him. And I'm like, telling him to cut off the chainsaw. And as soon as he cut the chainsaw up, this thing just hopped up, turned around, and walked down the fence line. And disappeared into the brush right there. And as soon as I got my dad to turn around to look... And it was gone. And he, he looks at me and he, I tell him, Dad, there was a wolf sitting right over there watching you. And he just looked at me and said, there's no wolves here. You, you got to be crazy. It was probably just a dog. I'm like, Dad, I know what a wolf is. And there was one sitting next to the fence, just as tall as the fence, looking at you. And he just blew me off. He didn't believe that I saw anything of consequence. He might have think I saw a dog or something. But that fence along that side of the property it's about it's just under four feet and that thing was sitting with its head 
at the top of the fence. And I saw it from a distance. And by the time I got to where my dad was, it was a good 150 or 200 feet away from where my dad was, but it freaked me out. And that's another reason I was always wary, but this was immediately after they had come in with tractors and cleared the whole property. So you could actually see better than you could, but there were giant piles of debris and brush all over the property that we ended up burning off the next couple years. And, and it really upset me that he didn't believe that I saw what I saw. And I was just like, okay, can't tell you about anything because he wouldn't believe me anyway. Even if it was right in front of him, he would have to see it for himself. Apparently I've tried to talk to him about it since. And he just thinks I'm full of it, which is really depressing. But that's pretty much that story. Now we had a horse on the property. His name was red and we kept him in a smaller size crowd pen but my window looked out towards the pole barn half of the pole barn was for storage and the other half was for the horse and i could see full view i could see more than 80 percent of the caged in area for the horse and when we first had gotten him up there there were nights when he would not stop panting grunting and just running circles inside the cage like he was upset about something and and being vocal about it and stomping his ground and he even tried um he had kicked the fence that we had for him was a horse fence but it was also lined with um bob wire not bob wire fence uh chicken wire excuse me because sometimes we would put the dog in there with the horse just to keep him out of trouble because after about a year, my dog, you know, lab learned where the river was. And every six months he would walk down there and go eat dead salmon and get sick. So we ended up having to start keeping him caged up a little more. So we put him in with the horse and it wasn't Max that was making this horse rambunctious. Something else was because it, he'd be okay. And then there'd be a night or two in a row where he'd be stomping around almost all night, making noise. A couple times he kicked the cage. And we could tell because there were dent marks in the cage. That and I could hear it. Now, mom always encouraged me to take the horse out and get it some exercise. And I did. He was a big horse. He was, I believe, 16 hands, which is really tall for a horse. And for me to saddle him up, get the bridles on and all the pads first. And then the saddle was an ordeal and I I'd do it. And the horse didn't like going on the driveway, did not like going down on the driveway. He would always try and go up to the top of the property and then we could go down tumbleweed. Well, the couple of times that I took him down our driveway to the corner he got not only spooked, I was riding him. He, he was not wanting to go down there. I go take him down there and we're on the driveway past the low point. The horse does a 180 and then bolts up the hill while I'm riding him. When the horse bolts, there was, I didn't see anything. He bolted like the devil himself was trying to get him. Now this is in the same spots where I would see the eyes. The horse bolted through the woods and brushed, he was hauling butt and left me in a tree. He got really close to one of the trees. I got caught on one of the branches and then got slammed to the ground. I had to go chasing after Red. By the time I caught up to him, he was almost to the store a mile away. He must have just bolted and ran and ran and ran. But after getting knocked off the horse, I had the wind knocked out of me. But this was very frustrating for me because I had to go get him. So I went and got him. A couple of weeks later, I tried to ride him again. And I tried taking him the same way. He wouldn't go. He would get to the end of the garden. 
uh, 100, 150 feet from the actual corner and would not go any further that direction. And I was thinking, okay, I don't want him bucking me. We ended up turning around and going to the top of the property and over out through tumbleweed. Well, I'm pretty sure he smelled something because for him to not go, I, I believe something was down there that he could smell and was, didn't want any part of it. After he left me in the tree, I was not only bruised and battered, I had bruises on my knees and I had bruises all along my chest where the tree branch hit me because the tree branch hit me, knocked me off the horse, and then I was half perched on it. And then the, the branch broke and I slammed to the ground and messed up my knees pretty good. So I wasn't too happy having to go find him and bring him back. And and it took the better part of a couple hours to get him back that time. So I think he could smell something. Now, I had gotten a, a BB gun one Christmas. I believe it was my in seventh grade. And I believe this happened in seventh grade. It was after the property had been cleared, so you could actually see a good run. I was out on the lawn. Just checking things out. It was winter time ish. And I got that feeling of dread, that feeling of run, that feeling of you're not only being watched, something's trying to get you. And I'm, I'm on the grass, not far from the head, like less than a hundred feet away from my front door. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. I turn around and start walking towards the house. And I'm like, you know what? That's stupid. I have this feeling of fear. I, I should just stay here and, and see what's going on. Well, when I turned around, I saw this black flash, this giant black shape bolting from trees on the f me looking down the hill from the right side. And it was running towards the corner of the property where I would see the eyes. And it was running so fast, I only got a, a glimpse of it because there's woods and I would see it between the trees as it was running and it was just a black flash, boom, gone. And I was like, oh man, okay, it's here and I need to get inside. So I went inside and I was always wary to be outside. I was trying to get over my fear. Oh, just tell myself it was a bear. It was something. Fast forward a couple months, and where I had seen this thing running through the woods, I, I ended up going down with my BB gun one afternoon, and I'm messing with some rocks and probably pulling up scorpions under the rocks and messing with some stuff. And from my neighbor's property to the side of us, who my neighbor's property was cleared like a national forest. He was an old retired guy who spent all of his time clearing all the brush and doing burn piles and making his property look immaculate. Ours was not immaculate, even after the uh, tractor trailers came in and he had huge piles of stuff to burn. There was still a lot of stuff on our side. I'm looking at the ground and I see something from the corner of my eye dart from tree to tree getting closer to me. Now, this was not a black streak. This was a brown something. So I'm staring at the ground thinking, okay, I'm going to keep my attention down and see if I can check this out from the corner of my eye. Well, it bolted to a tree closer to me and I'm sitting there and I know it's at this tree. And then out of the corner of my eye, I just see a dog's head poke around the tree about six and a half, seven feet off the ground. A dog would poke around the tree, you know, a couple feet off the ground. This thing was way in the air. And this is a, a pine tree. I'm thinking, first thing in my mind, a werewolf's looking at me. What else could this be? I know something was looking in my window. Okay. It's, it's got to be something. And in my head, I'm trying to justify what, what could it be? Are you sure it's not just a dog? And it peeked its head around looking at me two different times with a pause in between of maybe 10 seconds. Like it was checking out what I was doing and ducked back behind. And then a few 
Seconds later, ducked out again. Well, the third time it did this, when it ducked its head back behind, I started running directly at it. I wanted to know what this thing was. After maybe three or four steps of running at it, it poked its head out, saw that I was running right at it, and then ran the exact opposite direction away from me to use the tree as cover as it was running away. When I got to the tree where it was ducking its head and looking at me, it had already made it to the far side of the property and was just tucking into the thicker brush on the other side of my neighbor's property that wasn't his. And this was a different, this was brown, but it was still pretty freaking big and it was definitely skinnier. It had the head of a Doberman, except it was brown with grayish white on the ears. The ears stuck straight up and seemed to have tufts of fur on the top, kind of like when you would think like a lynx has the longer hairs on the top of its ears. I got a real good look at its face. It looked like a Doberman twice the size of a normal headed Doberman. Now, when I got to the tree, I just saw a brown streak get into the thick bushes and it was gone. But it was definitely smaller in stature and size than the one that had chased us off the mountain. Definitely. And I'm thinking, oh man, oh great. This is what, this is, this is a werewolf. I had no other word for it. But it, se- it honestly, in retrospect, it seemed like it was just spying on me to check me out. When I bolted for it, I could see a look of surprise on its face right before it darted away. Like, taken aback, this thing's headed straight at me. Oh, I got to get out of here. I remember seeing it, like, do a, oh, my gosh, this idiot's running right at me. So, I knew something was in the woods. I always knew something was in the woods. Now, I try and stay out of the woods at night. If I had to, I'd stay on the driveway or the trails. But this was seventh grade. A couple years pass. I think it had come into my window a couple times in those years and knocked in the middle of the night and tried to get me to come look at it. But I never acknowledged that it was in my window when it was in my window. When I was asleep and I'd see the shadow on my curtains, I was scared. I'd pull the covers over my head, roll over, and act like I didn't see it. It really... Back then, made me afraid to be outside. I wouldn't venture far from the house for a while. It wasn't until I started to get a little bit older, and then I tell myself, oh, that's not what you saw. That must have been something else. When I started to get a little older, all the kids in my grade, starting in high school, we started to have the, I'm going to go TP your house. You're going to go TP my house between a lot of the people who lived in the valley. Uh, me and my best friend had gone and TP'd, snuck out of our house in the middle of the night and gone and TP'd a couple people's houses throughout the years. And my house <laughs> was the only one that never got TP'd. Maybe that's because I had a dog who would bark. I don't know. Maybe people tried and saw something. I don't know. Maybe because I lived way up in the woods, nobody wanted to come up there. I was coming back from sneaking out, from TPing a house. Now, we had been thwarted because somebody was up. So I have a backpack full of toilet paper walking up this trail that connects to the corner of the driveway where I had always seen the eyes. I'm walking up the driveway. And it's dead silent. I'm maybe 50 feet from the road where this trail connects. Granted, at this point in time, I'm not on our property, on someone else's property. And a tree snaps. By when I mean tree snaps, I'm not talking like I stepped on a stick. I'm talking like something snapped 
a branch, a good sized branch, really close to me. I know the trail like the back of my hand. I'd gone down and up and down that thing in the middle of the night without a flashlight, sometimes with a flashlight. I knew that trail well. This snap happened and my blood ran cold because I'm like, something's here with me. And I'm looking around. I did not have a flashlight with me. I had had one, but the batteries had died. So it was in my pocket. I knew it was useless. And I stopped. I'm looking around. It's absolutely quiet. There's no crickets. There's no nothing. And usually there's some crickets or frogs going because this is the little, I guess you call drainage ditch or somewhat of a creek at this time of year where all the water's running through it. I, so I'm, I'm hearing nothing except a little bit of trickle, trickle running water. And I probably stand there for a good minute just listening, just listening. I finally get the courage to take one more step and keep going. Well, I take two steps and again, snap. And it's close. It's super close. It's within 20 feet of me. Whatever snapped the branch. And it wasn't like a, a twig. It was a branch. I stop. I'm looking around. Something growled. And when something growled, it was to my left, closer to the, where the water was. That's when I, I bolted. I ran. I had a feeling I knew what it was, and I didn't want to stick around. When I got to the top of the trail and looked back, and it's just dead quiet, there's nothing. I'm like, ooh, okay, I think I know what that is. I had seen eyes consistently in the same area. And, and I do want to back up and say that the entire time that I lived on this property, once dusk hit, I would see eyes once in a while follow me around. Like if I was walking down the driveway, it would be off into the woods on the right-hand side and they would kind of follow me down. But they would always stay in that lower section of the property. Now, I think I was in eighth grade when this one happened. I was in our living room and we had two large bay windows that overlooked the grass. So you're looking down the hill. I was home alone for whatever reason. It was late in the evening. It was completely dark outside. The blinds were completely open and I'm sitting there watching TV and I see these two massive yellow eyes staring at me. From my position of where I'm sitting on the couch, I know nothing is that tall. It would have to be in a tree staring at me. And I'm, look, I'm looking at it, and this thing's looking at me, whatever it is. Yellow eyes just staring at me. I got extremely creeped out. I shut the blinds. As I'm shutting the blinds, they were the drop down kind. I peek and look, and it's still looking. It's still looking at me, and I get good bearings on where the eyes are, because I know the forest really well. The next day in the light, I go to that same spot, get my bearings, and I figure where I saw it. This thing had to have been seven or eight feet off the ground next to a tree, because it's all wooded right in there. There's pine, and there's a couple oaks. And I'm thinking, man, that this, this has to be what I think has been looking in my window, except I just remember thinking the distance between the eyes was huge. It was a good eight, 10 inches. And these eyes were massive. They were glowing yellow. The next day when I figured out where the eyes were, it had to have been standing seven or eight feet tall. Now, my sister wasn't very nice to me growing up. Let's just cap it at that. And once she got her license, when she turned 16, I was 13. Within the next year, six months or so, she kept asking me if I had ever seen a really large black dog on the lower end of the property, right on the, on the corner. I lied and said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. 
I didn't trust her. She would never use information for the good of anyone. So I just, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. She asked me quite a few times, have you seen this really, really large black dog? And I'd just be like, nope. I was like, okay, so she, my sister's somewhat seen it, although I didn't know what to make of my sister asking me that question because, okay, should I tell her? Should I not? I decided on caution and not saying anything. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Around that same time, this was a little, I guess I was a little younger. I was walking up my driveway with my best friend, Tyler. And we get right to the corner where the trail connects. This was around 10 o'clock at night. I was right before 10 o'clock. And we get to that corner up on the mountain behind us, not too far, but definitely with an inch earshot, the deepest, scariest, guttural howl I had ever heard. It went on for a good five or six seconds. And we could tell kind of where on the mountain it was. It wasn't too far away because it was further up on the property and to the right-hand side on my neighbor's property is where the sound came from. And it was terrifying. This howl was a combination wolf, scream, and deep bass that rocked your insides and just you could feel it in the inside of your chest tyler and i look at each other and just start running for my house now, you know we're not far from my house we run inside and we shut the door and we come in and my mom's in there and we're like mom did you hear that and she said yes what was that and tyler's all oh i think it was a mountain lion there was no mountain lion I've ever heard. I had heard mountain lions further up the mountain, and that was not a mountain lion. My mom had heard it. And she was like, stay inside tonight, guys. Don't go outside, and definitely don't go out in the morning until the sun's up. I'm like, yeah, mom, <laughs> you got it. We ain't going anywhere. When I first hit high school, you know, I was always trying to tell myself, that's not what you saw. That's not what you heard. All these instances of seeing a black flash and there, there's quite a few of them where I remember hiking a couple times with my sister and seeing a black flash. I was always trying to tell myself it isn't what I think it is. Well, I was always fighting my fear to go outside. Once I hit high school, the whole teeping of other people's houses started along with shenanigans that you do when you're a teenager and you live in the woods and there's nothing else to go do except cause some trouble, sneak out of the house in the middle of the night, maybe go light off some fireworks, typical teenage stuff. I was always fighting the urge to not go out because of what I had seen. I would stick to my driveway, period. I would stick to my driveway. I really didn't go off the driveway much. At night, that I'm talking at night. Well, coming back from one of my teeping excursions after we had had some fun teeping someone's house, and I'm coming back. I'm walking on the driveway. I'm walking on the right hand side of the driveway, and I get right to the point where I'd always see the eyes on the corner of the driveway, on the corner of the property, and something growls at me. And I'm talking. Deep, deep, guttural. This wasn't, if it was a dog, it was a really big dog in my head. And I switched sides. I'm on the right side of the driveway. I walked to the left side of the driveway and it rumbles again. And I get a real good beeline on where this thing could be in front of me. It's not 20 feet away. It's behind a big chaparral bush. I'm not seeing anything. And it growls a third time. Well, I'm like, okay. I'm thinking I need to defend myself because it's the neighbor's dog and he might try to attack me. I reach down and grab two good sized rocks. And I throw the first one and yell, get away from me. And I missed. I could hear it go off in the bushes. 
and I throw the second rock and I hear it go thunk and I hit flesh. Well, I'm standing there. I didn't move. I hear rustling in the bushes and I hear this popping noise that sounded like when you walk on gravel, the crunch, crunch, like crunch, pop, crunch, pop. There was about five or six of them of this crunch pop noise rustling in the bushes. And I'm thinking, oh man, this dog's going to attack me. And it stands up. It's nighttime out. There's stars. There's a sliver of a moon. It's probably a little less than a quarter. All I see from behind the bush, this thing stands up. I see a wolf's head. I see its eyes. I see it's bearing its white teeth at me. I can tell that it has shoulders and its ear is flopped to the side like the one that I would see in my window. And I was all, what the? In that time frame of me thinking, what the? I realize what it is. I realize that it's not 20 feet from me. It's bearing its teeth at me. It's completely black, but I can see the lighter colors of the head. It had some gray color on the ears, on the tufts of the ears that were lighter, and it had a couple lighter patches on its chest. I couldn't see out anything in definition on its chest, but I could tell that it had shoulders, and this thing was tall. In the half second and a half, two seconds that I'm looking at it, it was like something screamed in my head, not my own voice, run. And I did. I found myself running before I even could think. It was like somebody in my, just projected in my head, run. And it was, I was doing it. And I, it didn't seem like it was my thought. It was probably my fight or flight reaction. I get halfway up the driveway and I look back, make sure nothing's following me. Nothing's following me. I get inside. I shut the door. I lock the door. And that night is when everything changed. The relationship it had with me of just sort of being there and around and not showing itself completely changed. I had to go to school early in the morning. Half the time it was dark out for me to catch the bus. This thing was letting me know every morning that it was there and it was following me through the woods about halfway down the driveway till I got to the part where the road did another 90 degree turn. It really didn't follow me past that corner that I know of. But every morning it was either on the high side down below me or on our property on the high side up above me. And it was letting me know that it was there and that it was following me. Maybe 50 75 or 100 feet, depending on the day. I could see the glowing eyes on it. I could hear it walking, and it was always on four. When it was following me through the woods, it was on four. When I got home, the same thing. It seemed like it was always, from that point in time, was waiting for me in those bushes for me to come walk by so that it could, A, let me know that it was there, and B, Scared the ever living daylights out of me every time. I was not handling this very well. I started smoking weed to deal with it because I didn't want to deal with it. I tried talking to a couple of my friends and basically we're going to call it a liar. So I couldn't tell anyone. I kept my mouth shut and I was just smoking weed to deal with it because it numbed my senses to the point where I didn't have to deal with it. And after two or three weeks of this, every day I stopped going to school. My parents thought that something was wrong with me because I wouldn't tell them why I was doing what I was doing. And my mom made the decision after she got my report card in December that I was going to go live with my dad because she couldn't force me to go to school and finish high school. And boy, was I happy. I didn't even have words to express how happy I was that I was going to be leaving. There were a few instances of me going down the driveway and it was starting to get closer. It was starting to get a lot closer. 
to the point where I could make out its shape through the gloom because the sun was always barely coming up. And it, was, it kept getting closer. I only thought it was a matter of time until it actually took me out. I was scared bonkers. I didn't know what else to do. So I was dealing with it in a completely wrong way by just getting stoned every day and trying not to deal with it. It was really difficult to be put in a situation that I couldn't talk about to anyone because nobody believed me. Nobody would believe that this was happening to me and they thought I was full bonkers. Now, after this happened, this thing was coming to my window and tapping on my window every other night for weeks at a time. I was not sleeping well. I was having to smoke weed to finally fall asleep and then having to get up and then have to go outside and deal with this thing. Uh uh-uh. uh. I was, I was at my wit's end and I was so happy. <laughs> my parents were extremely mad at me for flunking out a whole semester because I had just dropped the ball and just said, nope, I, I can't deal with this. I'm not. And I, they, they thought I was going insane. Now, had I told them actually what was going on, they probably would have labeled me insane. And I just kept my mouth shut and said, no, no, I'm just a teenager. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. In retrospect, I think my mom would have been able to understand what I was going through because I've talked with her about it now that I'm older and that I can actually deal with it. And she, she's very understanding. My dad, uh-uh. He, he, he didn't understand nothing. He's, to this day, those things don't exist. Like, okay, cool. I, I, that last few, three weeks of me walking down the driveway I thought I was going to get clever about a week into it and then cut across my neighbor's property to make a big loop around the other direction. Maybe it wouldn't follow me. Well, about two or three days of going that way, it figured out what I was doing and was waiting for me and following me out that direction. And that's when I stopped going to school because that's when it was getting a lot closer every time. And I mean, when it's dusk out and you can just, barely see and there's a big thing and you know what that thing is and it's consistently trying to stalk you scare you i don't know what you want to call it but it was definitely inching closer because the first couple times it followed me it was it was there but it was a little ways away maybe 100 feet through the woods and then it was just closer and then closer and then i'd try running through there And I would hear it running through the woods, following me almost step for step. I I just couldn't handle it. And I'm, I'm actually very grateful that mom was like, well, I can't make you go to school. So you're going to live with your dad. And I went and finished high school in another state and got myself out of that situation. My mom ended up selling the property about a year later. I think she sold it in early 98, 99, somewhere in there. I think, no, by the time I had graduated high school in 98, she had already sold it. That's right. I think she sold it in April of 98. At that point in time, she didn't know what I was going through. It was, it was really something else. Now, fast forward years later, I'm living 20 miles away from Roosh in Medford, literally right off of Foothill Roads in these older houses that had originally been orchard houses for all the orchard workers. And I'm living in a house where all these orchards came right up to my house. From my house for the next five miles was nothing but orchards. And I was happy living there until one day I'm going to where we park the cars, which is On the other side, it's actually a Delta Waters address, and it was evening time. There was a little bit of light. Something caught my eye to the right, right where the uh, fence was. The property next to us was completely fenced in because they grew pot. And looking at me from the corner of the fence with its hand on top of the 4 by 4 post 
was a dog man. I think the exact same one from 20 plus years prior, it had a kink in its ear. This thing was standing on two dog legs, huge, huge hands. The hair on its head and its chest was grayish. And this thing's looking at me dead center and it smiles. This evil, sinister grin where I can see all of its teeth smiles at me. This had caught me completely unawares. I run back inside and just about have a heart attack. It didn't follow me. It didn't chase me. To and through, if it wanted me right then and there, I was dead meat. I wasn't 40 feet from it. It was, I think, the same one. I think for whatever reason, our paths crossed again. Maybe he smelled me out. Maybe he saw me. I don't know. It was a very scary moment to have to relive everything. But then my wife saw it too a few days later in the orchard staring at her. And then that's when I actually started to open up to my wife about my past experiences because I always kept them to myself because nobody wanted to hear them and I didn't want to be told you're a liar. It, it's just, it, it was actually a, a pretty good moment for my wife and I. We weren't married then to open up and tell her about my experiences and this thing. We lived there for another couple of years, but I immediately upon seeing this thing went inside, cut up a bunch of cardboard and cover it up all the windows so that you could not see in and you could not see out. A couple other times there was some tapping on the window late at night and I just ignored it. And this was in a very small time frame of when we originally saw this thing on our property. And I, I didn't want to acknowledge it. I didn't want to see out the window. I could still open the windows during the day and I get some airflow. I didn't even want to go there anymore and just clammed it up. And it seemed to go away on its own. My wife had two experiences where she saw it, came back inside, and then I had to go around the long way on the road to get the car for her to make it to work on time. And that's my most recent experience. Wow, Cody, that's a lot of experiences. You really did have a rough go of it. If the dogman that chased you and Tyler down the mountain that day would have stood up on the two legs, how tall do you think it would have been? Seven and a half, eight and a half feet. Dogs can stretch really long, but this thing was thick, super thick. You could tell it was just muscle. You could just tell it was built like a bear. So it was, it was massively round, as in bulk, and pr it probably stood at all of eight feet. For it to be looking in my window, it had to have been seven and a half, eight feet tall. Because a couple of the times that I caught it looking at me, I think it was hunched over looking at me, not standing up to its full height. I just tried. I remember specifically, I was doing social studies homework in eighth grade at my desk. And my window is 90 degrees to my right. And I remember it was history, American history. And I look over and sure as snot, giant wolf's head, one eye. I can see the snout because I had left my curtains open maybe six or eight inches. And this thing's just eyeballing me. I got up, didn't acknowledge that it was there. and went into the bathroom and cried. I remember specifically this one stands out amongst everything that was even me throwing a rock at this wasn't as scary as knowing there's a werewolf looking at me through my window when I'm doing my homework because it wasn't late. It was just dark. It gets dark at 430 in Oregon in the wintertime. And 
I never did homework in my room again. I would do it out in the living room where I, I could have everything, comp- all the windows completely shut and nothing could look in. I never finished. I never did homework again in my room. So, yeah. Well, homework's bad enough as it is, not to mention when you've got a big dog meal looking in your bedroom window at you. I'm a little mixed on this still. Were you mad at Tyler for waiting until he was well past you before warning you to run? I couldn't be mad. I probably would have done the same thing. And as I look at my notes, I realize I forgot a really important aspect of this entire thing. I had it on a separate sheet. About a week after my rock incident, Tyler called me up, wanted to come hang out, and it was already dark outside. I said, sure, come on up. And I think it's getting on closer to 10 o'clock. And he shows up at my house out of breath, white as a sheet, saying something chased him and was biting at him on that trail that we always walk through that connected to the corner of the driveway because it was a direct line of sight from his house to my house. It was almost a straight shot straight up the mountain. And he had his left cuff because at the time baggy pants were the in in the 90s and he had gotten jinkos and his jinkos were ripped from right at the bottom where the cuffs were there was a big old hole where you could see something grabbed it and it ripped it but it didn't tear any of the fabric off of it completely but it ripped a big hole in it he was white as a ghost he was saying something just chased him something really big and was trying to attack him he was pale absolutely pale now he didn't have a flashlight it was completely dark and he was like i just got attacked i just got attacked his cuff was ripped and tyler wasn't one to be scared of much he was always the big tough guy well actually the little tough guy with a chip on his shoulder he was short of stature But he was always the tough person around that if you didn't want to mess with. And he came in white as a sheet. This is about a week or so after my incident of throwing the rock at it. And he is just like, I can't believe this just happened. Something almost just got me. And I looked him square in the eyes and I said, yeah, it was, you know what it was. It was a thing that chased us off the mountain couple years ago and he looks at me and his eyes get wider i'm like look tyler if i told you that i had werewolves living in my forest would you believe me his eyes got as big as saucers he didn't say anything other than that he wouldn't say anything other than that he completely clammed up about it and would not talk about it even years later after high school i moved back to the area and we hung out for a few more years, he wouldn't talk about it. He would not even give a description of what he thought he saw. He just clammed up 100%. But when I said, A, it was what chased us off the mountain, and B, would you believe me if I told you I had werewolves living in my woods? His immediate response was, I'm never coming back up here. I'm never coming to your house again. And I'm probably not going to be going outside at night anymore. And that's all he ever said. I don't blame him. I had never had it attack me. And I would be completely scared and probably not want to talk about it if I didn't know all the other stuff that I do know about the property. That was the only time I think that I know of that this thing openly attacked someone. And that got me super scared. That was actually the reason I started cutting through my neighbor's property. At that point, it had already been stalking me. And I was just trying to ditch it any way I could. But it got on to me by the second or third day and started following me through the neighbor's property, which was even more scary because his property was clear and I had a much better view of what was following me. And let's just say I didn't leave the house sober. Ever. Yeah, knowing what was out there the way you did, it's going to make you take some pretty drastic measures. No, I get it. It really is a shame that even after that one tore his pants the way it did, he still wouldn't back you up the way he should have. Some people deal with it in other ways, you know? He just, he 
We didn't talk about it. So I, I just, I, I just kept the same MO. I'm like, okay, if you're not going to talk about it, I, I really, I don't trust anyone else. I tried telling a couple of my friends, classmates, and they just, that's what they literally told me. So I just didn't tell anyone, kept my mouth completely quiet, which is kind of funny because after not going to school and ha- being forced to go live with my dad, my dad sent me to a psychiatrist for, for a few weeks. I had biweekly meetings with the psychiatrist. I never uttered a word. I never said anything to her. None of this ever came out. I wasn't about to open my mouth. And it was really gratifying a couple weeks later after going to the therapist, had a meeting with my dad and me and the therapist. And the therapist told my dad I was a completely normal teenager because my dad thought I was completely crazy. And I didn't even try to tell my dad anything. He just thought I was messed up in the head and that I had problems, which I did have problems. I just couldn't talk about them to people because having a, a, a venue to be able to relay what happened is probably the most therapeutic experience for me because not talking about it and bottling it up didn't help anyone. It didn't help me. It didn't help. It wasn't until years later when I can reflect upon everything. I always knew people don't believe this stuff. I wasn't going to let this affect me. I wasn't going to let it affect my ability to go outside. I mean, I spent 14 years in the woods as a wildland firefighter going all across the country on 20 man crews. I was on type A crews, which is an IA, which is initial attack. And I was on type two crews, which are just less initial attack. And I, I was very grateful. I'd been to 14 states fighting fire in the middle of nowhere. And if I had let this affect me in a much more negative way, I wouldn't have done that. But I knew I was safe for the most part because you're with a group of people. You're there for a task. You're in communication with one another. And I don't let it affect me anymore because if it had wanted to get me, it would have gotten me. And I don't know if it attacked Tyler thinking it was me or that because I showed aggression, it was going to chase out anyone who showed up. But Tyler was around that property enough and quite often throughout the years that I'm sure it knew who he was. I'm almost positive. So maybe that was just his way of, okay, this guy threw rocks at me and I'm going to scare you 10 ways to Sunday. But having his pants ripped, that's a whole nother level of, it was actively trying to get him. That's even scarier. And that's when I started to really freak out and just literally not be sober. I was consistently stoned for a couple months there. Well, I can understand why you thought that it was trying to get him, but understand dogmen are so fast, so powerful, so well equipped that if it really wanted to get him, it would have gotten him. There's no two ways about that. Very true. And I guess it just wanted to send a message to stay away, which after that point, he did. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'd say he did. Yeah. If they want to get a message across, yeah, they're pretty good at doing that. The day when you were behind your home and saw that dog man standing with its hand resting on that fence post, how tall did you say it was? It was ginormous. The fence post itself was 12 and a half feet in the air. And I had measured it because I was curious how big their fence was and how tall this thing was. Its left hand was on top of the post. Its hand was about the same level as its ears when it grinned at me. Oh, so we're talking about a 12-foot dog man. He was stretched out, like stretched all the way out. His legs, he wasn't like hunched over at all. He, I think he was just trying to make himself look as big as possible. Like just stand straight up like you do for pictures at school. Well, still to do that, even if he had to stretch out, that's still a big dog man. Yeah, not good. He was super, super thick. He was tapered at the waist, much skinnier on the waist, but it was, he looked like a bodybuilder style body, huge arms. You could see the muscles under the skin and dark fur surrounded with patches of gray and on his head around the muzzle was a lot of gray. Same with the top half of its head was a lot of gray. 
Yeah, I'm sure that's a sight that you're never going to get out of your head, and for good reason. I just wish I had a camera. Yeah, well, you know it is. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. You said your wife freaked out when she had her encounter a few days after the day when you saw that huge dog man reaching with his hand up on top of the fence post. How's she dealing with her encounter now? After I told her all of my experiences, she says she didn't really feel threatened, but it was right on the corner of the orchard. It was on all fours and it was just staring at her. She was working the graveyard shift at the time, which means that she would go in, I think, at 11. So this is about 1030-ish. And she came running back in, slammed the door, said there's a giant wolf thing outside. And she didn't know what to do. She was wanting to call the police. And I said, no, don't do that. I ended up walking out to the road, which connected to the other road to get the car and brought it around the long way without going into the backyard on that night. She handled it much better than I would have thought someone with no experience would handle it, if you know what I mean. Because there's no question in her mind what she saw. And then when I'm relaying all my stories to her, her jaw just about hit the floor. She was shocked. And she was actually shocked that I never really told anybody. And honestly, it brought us a lot closer together, being able to relay all those experiences and actually rehashing all this stuff from years and years ago and looking at it from a much more objective point of view. So it has actually been a very good thing. Yeah, sounds like it. It's really hard to figure out. I mean, after all, some people have bad dogman encounters and come out of those experiences smelling like roses. Other eyewitnesses have a lot of trouble dealing with relatively mild encounters. So there really is no rhyme nor reason to how an eyewitness is going to respond to an encounter they have. Yeah. At the time, I was falling to pieces. To be perfectly honest, I didn't handle it well, and that's why I was smoking pot and trying to ignore it but it wasn't letting me ignore it <laughs> yeah it was forcing the point no doubt about that if you could go back and share wisdom with your 10 year old self cody about those experiences what advice would you give your younger self i would tell my younger self like something we say in fire it's called situational awareness and maybe that's why I make such a good firefighter is just be aware of what's going on around you at all times, whether you're in the woods, you're in the city, be aware of your surroundings and don't throw rocks at a big bad wolf. That would be my advice. Don't show aggression if you don't want this thing showing aggression towards you. Because once I threw rocks at it, everything changed. Everything changed. And it was, I think, a bit peteeved, obviously, that I did. And that it was letting me know that it didn't like me doing that. And tried to chase me away, which it effectively did. But my life would be 100% different had I not thrown rocks at it. I probably would have finished high school here. I probably wouldn't have, in my early 20s, ended up going back to California because I had friends down there and a job opportunity to get into the trades and learn a trade. I ended up moving back down there in my early 20s and going through the Carpenters Union apprenticeship program. I probably would have never done that had I not left. I, who knows where I'd be or what I'd be doing. But I'm very happy in this life that I've lived and the decisions I've made in this life. Going to two different high schools definitely made me a stronger person. I had to ride a bike partly on the 101 freeway to make it to Carpinteria High School on a daily basis. And it definitely rounded me out as a person, let me tell you. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad to hear that you're dealing with those experiences in such a healthy way. That sure does beat the alternative, after all. I don't like the alternative. I like living. And yeah, I like being here. Maybe not now with this whole quarantine thing, but hopefully someday... All this will end and some sort of normalcy will come back to the way we live life. Yeah, I hope it does. I hope it does. 
Well, Cody, we're about out of time, but before we get out of here, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I just want to thank you for letting me vent my experiences and share them. So people know that if you have these experiences, you're not crazy. These are real flesh and blood creatures that are out there and that people need to know about them so that you can take precautions for yourself and your loved ones and not find yourself in compromising situations. Well, that's all very well said. I guess the big takeaway is don't throw rocks at dog men. <laughs> that could be my uh, keynote for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it could be. Well, Cody, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing those experiences with us. I really do appreciate it. My pleasure, Vic. Well, thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.